We are live. We are live. Live Welcome and kicking. Everybody. Yep. Back another Thursday night with Dr. James yeah. Scott Wright and yep. me, Rachel yeah. Grubbs. Yes. Uh, so this is week five. Five. That's week right. Five. Week five. Yep. Um, so everybody, as you're logging on, please type in the comments. We want to hear from you. So say hello. Tell us your name. Tell us where you're watching from. Yeah. I see Beisha. beisha has been here a few weeks. Thanks for coming back. Awesomeness. Awesomeness. It's always great to have everybody here. Yep. I see I, I look, Hello. I look, hello. I look forward to this every week. It's awesome. Melina from somewhere in the mitten. I forget where. Maybe here-ish. Don't worry, I won't dox you. I just know you're somewhere in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle Brianna. of the country. Well, in the mitten, right? Like Michigan is a mitten. Ah, uh, there you go. Yeah, if you're from Michigan, you usually tell people where you are based on the mitten. Michigan, yeah, yeah there she goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, awesome. Caitlin from Southern Virginia. Oh, and I said your name perfectly. <laughs> I'm so glad because I did guess. <laughs> um, <That's awesome. laughs> cool. All right. Very well, cool. we like to kind of give people time to log in and say yeah. hi. Good evening. Austin, Justin. Texas. Woohoo. Omar from California. I definitely hi, recognize almost all of these names. You guys have been here week after week. We love yes. it. Awesome. And it's totally fine if you're here for the first time this week. McPherson, Kansas, but representing nice. the University of Kansas Jayhawks. Portland. Jayhawks. Now, are you Portland, Oregon or Portland, Maine? Oh, good question. I bet it's Oregon. Oregon, yep. told you. I feel like yep. usually the Portland Mainers say Portland, Maine. I think they understand they're not the default yeah. Portland, but I, you never know. Yeah, you never know. That's true. That is true. All right. Well, I'm going to get to doing some introduction. I just like to give everybody a chance to log on. Yeah. So welcome back to, as we said, this is week five. Yep. Um, this is a seven week series. So for those of you that have been, he been here every week, thank you so much for um, being a loyal follower. Uh, for those of you that are here for the first time, it is totally fine. You can pick up at any point. Each of these sessions, certainly they, they talk to each other, but each one stands alone. So hopefully you'll get a lot out of it, whether you're new or not. Um, the uh, uh, present presenter this evening is this fellow right here, <laughs> right? <laughs> and Dr. Wright has been in medical education for 25 years. He was the director of admissions at UT Southwestern Med. He was the executive director of TMD SAS, so the Texas yeah. Dental Application Service. Yeah. He also served as an undergraduate dean, so working in a pre-health office. Um, Lots and lots of experience on all the different angles of pre-med. So we love to see that. And um, oops, where'd you go? There we go. Here I am. <laughs> um, Hello. So tonight, Dr. Wright is going to talk a little bit about the attributes and qualities that med schools want to see from you. Um, as you guys know, there's lots of numbers and stats involved, but that's not the whole story. So we're going to dig into that a little bit. Um, if you've been here before, you know, we usually talk for 30, 40 minutes, and then we try to get into a lot of questions and answers. So at any point throughout the program, please feel free to type in comments, type in questions. We might address them as we go, but certainly we'll address them mm. towards the end. We Absolutely. want to have plenty of time to have you engaged in talking to us and getting some feedback. So yep. I will let... Dr. Wright, take it over from here. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. It's so it's always good to see uh, the crew that's here on uh, Thursday nights, and, and welcome to you. I hope that your uh, evening is going well. I know out on the West Coast, it's only about 5 p.m., but uh, East Coast time, it's 8, and here in Austin, Texas, in the middle of the country, it is uh, already dark outside, 7 o'clock, which I don't really like this time change it's taken me a while it always takes me a while to get used to it and it's kind of kind of worrisome to me because it gets dark so so early and uh but anyway and it is what it is but welcome to everybody and i'm i'm uh, super excited to, to see all of you here and and we'll have a good conversation tonight about uh, about the attributes that we'll focus on one in particular tonight that 
that I think medical schools are looking for and what they want to see in their, in their incoming students and what's valuable to see in a caregiver, ultimately. And I think what, what, I'm, what many of you who have been around over the course of the last few weeks, well, I, I hope what you've seen is it's really these attributes are very much uh, what we all want to see out of just basically human beings. You know, they're, 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 they're good qualities to have as, as, a, uh, as a stable, uh, well-balanced uh, human. And, uh, and so, and, and I hope you see that, but certainly very valuable traits to have as a caregiver in the, in the world of healthcare in, in the 21st century. So we'll, we'll hop into this. As you know, that the AAMC identified uh, nine different personal traits uh, or uh, pre, what they call pre-professional competencies uh, that they identified. This is uh, about 10 years ago that they identified these, and they're uh, certainly just as applicable now as they were 10 years ago and, and, and have been over the course of you know, time. And, uh, and these are, as I said, what they expect to see out of students coming into medical school. These are not things that you're going to develop in medical school. Uh, I'm sure that these will, there is an evolution on these types of things that occurs over time, but they're expecting to see these from you coming in from the very beginning. A service orientation, social skills, cultural competence, teamwork, oral communication skills, uh, the, eth the uh, intra uh, personal qualities of ethical responsibility, both to yourself and to others. Reliability and dependability, being resilient and adaptable. And then, as we know, uh, physicians are lifelong learners, and so the, com the capacity for improvement is also uh, very important, and we're going to uh, talk about that a little bit next week. And, and what we, what, what's clear is that when you have an experience in your life, that it, it rarely is it just a one attribute kind of thing that you experience at that moment or in that in that opportunity but it crosses over many of these uh, uh competencies and 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 so what what i hope we see is that it's a it's a very dynamic situation here uh where multiple competencies can be exhibited through uh participating in in a, in a certain activity uh etc so to not so what i have done is um, identified six uh, characteristics, six of these personal traits that, that med schools want to see, and that we've gone through tonight is week five. And so we talked initially about altruism, the importance of being focused on others. Uh, we obviously want to see that in our caregivers, uh, being selfless uh, in the face of uh, our tasks. Uh, the second week, we talked about humility and the importance of uh, being modest in, in terms of viewing ourselves and, and how we relate to those uh, around us. Week three, we talked about self-awareness and the importance of uh, understanding our strengths and our weaknesses, the, the character flaws that sometimes we have, and how we, get, uh, how we relate to others with regard to those, uh, those uh, traits uh, and and those strengths and weaknesses and, and very important for a caregiver to understand and identify their limits and their weaknesses and uh, being able to uh, admit when we uh, when we make a mistake potentially. Last week we talked about autonomy and the importance of of uh, individual uh, the the importance of uh, of being individually stable in in particular in the Western. In, in Western society where individuality is expected, uh, whether it's legally or, or, uh, or socially, uh, and the importance of, of being able to make your own decisions and being able to forcefully put forward uh, who you are in the community of uh, the social community and in the case of, uh, of healthcare and in, on the healthcare team. So tonight we're going to talk about accountability. And accountability really is one of those things where we, uh, we, we, we often don't like the thought of accountability. I mean, I mean none of us likes that. We, 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 we would wish that we would not be accountable uh, often in terms of our 
uh, of our behaviors. But I think it's an important consideration that we talk about and that we evaluate and, and understand better uh, what, what accountability is. And so what we can do is define accountability as the acknowledgement and assumption of responsibility. So I acknowledge and I assume responsibility for my own actions and my own decisions. So there's two parts to that, the acknowledgement of and the assumption of responsibility for my own actions and my own decisions. Essentially, it's really all about being able to give a reason for why I'm behaving in a certain, in a certain way and take ownership of that. Uh, you, know, you know, when we talk about uh, immature people, uh, children, for example, who don't take on accountability, anybody, any of you that have uh, children in your life, whether it's a, a smaller brother or sister or a, a nephew or niece, or, or maybe you just have uh, uh, friends that have children or, or, or whatever, we recognize that kids do not accept res responsibility or accountability for their own actions. After all, the very first thing, when something happens, you know, you break a vase or, or a window and, and something occurs, a, a behavior happens, the very first thing that a child does is says, it was his fault. It was her fault. Uh, I didn't do it. It wasn't my fault. It was somebody, somebody else is responsible for whatever has occurred. I mean, this is very common in, 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 um, among children. And, and, and I know a lot of adults who are this exact same way. And that, that's a signal of immaturity for adults to, be, to, to not accept responsibility for their, for their own actions. Um, this word accountability is, is you, you would note that it really comes from the ideas of record keeping, that I'm keeping, uh, I'm keeping a record or I'm calculating out what I've done. I'm reckoning what I've done with uh, the responsibility that I have. I'm counting that out, uh, my behaviors, and I'm counting toward the consequences of my of my actions, of my behaviors. Um, we can see this played out in a variety of different ways in pop culture and in political culture. I've got a couple of pictures here that I think you'll, you'll, you'll find interesting. One, can anybody tell me who the gentleman on the left is? I didn't put his name on there. Anybody got an, any idea who this man on the left is? You can just type that into the uh, comments uh, section of uh, on uh, uh, on here and and, and let, let me know. Anybody got any ideas who the man on the left is? I'll test you out to see how how strong you are in historical uh, U.S. knowledge of, of historical figures in U.S. history. No one has responded. I'm super disappointed that nobody knows this man. He is a past president. Is that helpful? a past president of the United States. Oh, thank you, Harry Truman. That's exactly right. This is Harry Truman, uh, president of the United States uh, from really 19, uh, 1945 through 1952. And uh, was not, uh, unlike most presidents, was not a wealthy man, grew up basically poor in, in, uh, out just outside of uh, Kansas City, Missouri. And so he was kind of a, a self-made man in a lot of ways. But what's, it, what's really important here is the idea that as president, he's very famous for one particular uh, quote, one particular thing that he would say about himself. And he had a sign on his desk in the Oval Office, and it said, the buck stops here. The buck stops here. In other words, I'm going to be held accountable for my actions, and I recognize that there are consequences to the actions that, that I have, to, to my behaviors. Now, as an alternative to that, how many of you, if, you, if you've seen this movie before, uh, just type in, yes, I've seen, I've seen the movie, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And this has sort of become over the years, this is from 1984 or 86, I can't remember, mid 80s. Uh, and uh, this has kind of become a cult classic uh, as a movie. If you haven't seen the movie, it's well worth seeing. 
It's uh, it's it's very humorous. It's comedy, and Matthew Broderick plays this uh, boy who uh, who uh, is uh, basically taking a day off from school. And the, the, the point of this movie is there's no accountability whatsoever. In nowhere in the movie is he ever had is he ever had the the uh, the is he ever held accountable. He he lies to his parents about why he wants to stay home. He acts, acts like he's sick, and and it's just over and over and over throughout the entire movie. He's doing uh, whatever he wants to do, and he's never held accountable for his actions. Now, don't get me wrong; I like this movie a lot. It's uh, it's very funny. Uh, it's got a lot of humor in it. It's uh, it's it's a delightful movie. And if you haven't seen it before, you should definitely definitely Netflix it and and uh, watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Uh, very very cool movie. But uh, the, it's an example of the opposite of accountability. There's no consequences for uh, for his actions whatsoever. Um, now, what are some attributes? Uh, of accountability. Oh, I messed that up. It should say accountability, not autonomy. But you get the point. Attributes of accountability. In first of all, you're uh, responsible for your own actions. You're responsible for your own actions. You are in charge of your of yourself, and you're going to to be held accountable for those for those actions. You're able to admit when you're admit when you're wrong. We probably all know people in our lives who never do this. They are wrong and they never admit it. They never own up to a mistake. They face the consequences of their actions, an attribute of accountability, facing the consequences of our actions. Uh, we don't like this part of accountability. We're trustworthy. Uh, reliable and dependable. We're going to get to talking about that more, but it, it's like we, we have to recognize that part of accountability is you can rely on me. You can uh, hold me uh, 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 to account. Uh, you can depend on the fact that I'm going to Hey, Scott, we seem to have lost your audio. I just wanted to chime in. Everybody, please stand by. Thank you for your patience. He's back. He's back. It's just Where did a quick I leave little off? blip. What? Tiniest of little blips. That happened last week, I think. Yeah, it did. Uh, you had just gotten to the last bullet point. I mean, oh, like, okay. As okay. soon as I heard you go out, I chimed in. So yeah, thank you. Like, Sorry about that. I'm not exactly sure how that's how that's happening. But thank you, Rachel, for holding me accountable. Thank you for that. Thumbs up for accountability on my part. Um, so what are the related behaviors to uh, accountability? Uh, a, a good example would be uh, that you've held a job, a, a, lo a long-term job, or even a volunteer work. And we all know that when you hold a job or when you're when you're in a, a long-term type of volunteer sort of situation, that you're going to be held accountable. Uh, in, in, a, in a work situation, you do something wrong, you get in trouble. Or you don't do something that you should have done, you get in trouble. You, you're, you're held accountable for those things. Um, a good point here is a related behavior to accountability would be, do you attend class regularly? Do you arrive to class on time? These are accountability uh, types of things. Uh, when I used to be in the classroom uh, as a professor, I would be very frustrated when students would show up late. And it was always the same students. And, and, and uh, at times I would mention that. Thanks for uh, coming. Glad you could make it, albeit 15 minutes late, like last week. So that's a little, you know, it's kind of a little snarky of me to do that, but uh, you know, it was pointing out that uh, that there are consequences here. And you know, sometimes if I would give a quiz at the beginning of class, clearly there's consequences to to that action. Uh, another related behavior being, can you relate a time when you made a mistake, and what consequences followed from that mistake? Uh, I'm very interested always. I, I, 
back when this uh, TV show was on, I used to watch uh, on occasion, not often. There was a, a show called Live, T- uh, Live PD. Live PD is in police department. And it was always interesting. It, 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 these were live cameras that they would have in various police departments around the country. And it was always interesting to me how the, the people that they would be dealing with, whether they pulled them over or what, whatever was happening, it was never their fault. It, you know, it was always something else. There was always, I, I didn't know I was speeding. I didn't know the speed limit. I didn't know that was a uh, wrong to do that or whatever. There was no account, you know, no acceptance of responsibility uh, for, for the actions of, uh, of yourself. So it's uh, very interesting uh, to me uh, that we, uh, that we as humans often try very earnestly to avoid accountability uh, and it's not fun it, don't get me wrong it's not fun to have consequences for our actions but it is what it is now the, the next thing i would like to say you know well, let's relate these back to um the double amc competencies and before we put that uh, slide up i, I want to see what do you think uh you guys that are listening tonight what do you think uh, of the core competencies that the that the double AMC has identified, which ones do you think really relate here to um, which w- ones relate to accountability? Some of them are, are pretty obvious, and and some of them uh, some of them are not, and uh, maybe not as as, as obvious. But what what do you think? What what are those uh, what are those do you think might be might be uh, might be relevant to here to this this uh, conversation about uh, accountability? Uh, one of them, uh, a couple of them, I, I you know, really in the, it pretty much enumerated when we were looking at the uh, the attributes. Uh, one of them, obviously, being uh, reliability and dependability. Yeah, there you go. Exactly. Somebody chimed in on that one. Reliability and dependability, which is uh, the uh, the yeah the next slide. So I consistently fulfill my obligations. In other words, I hold myself accountable. I take responsibility for my actions and my performance. Uh, I take responsibility. I assume the responsibility that is mine. I take that on. I own that. Uh, so definitely, or uh, reliability and dependability is a big one. I think another one uh, interesting that we could correlate with this is res- resilience and adaptability. Uh, that we demonstrate our tolerance of stressful and changing stressful situations, changing environments, and we adapt to them. We're persistent. So, I, in other words, what I'm doing, I recover from setbacks. I don't explain it away because often these setbacks that I have are my own fault. Maybe I didn't study uh, enough for a test, and so I get a C on a test. So I accept the responsibility that was mine in not studying enough or going out the night before or whatever. And uh, I own that and I accept that and I, and I accept the consequences that were there uh, because of that. Um, Another one I think that uh, is very relevant here is that of teamwork. Uh, That when you work together with other people, you hold them accountable and they hold you accountable. Uh, and, and this is a part of the sort of dynamic of, 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 of a social being, of the social beings that we are. Uh, we put, uh, in, in addition, we put uh, our team, the team goals ahead of our own personal goals. So, again, I'm holding myself accountable for team goals. And I, instead of, you know, putting myself forward, I am able to take to take on the the more importance of the team goals as opposed to my own necessarily my, my own goals. So teamwork is another one. Uh, obviously, there are others that that uh, uh, address uh, get addressed here. Somebody mentioned ethical responsibility to to yourself or others. Absolutely, uh, oral communication is is another good example of uh, of where these cross over in these various um, uh, core competencies uh, where they cross over. So very good points uh, that you're making. I've got a couple of, uh, of quotes here uh, that I really like. One is from Eleanor Roosevelt. Now, m- many of you did not know who Harry Truman was from his picture, 
Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt was the wife of uh, U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt. This was uh, back in the 30s and 40s, uh, 1930s and 40s, during uh, the Great Depression and World War, World War II. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt outlived her husband by quite a number of years and was not only the U.S. First Lady, but uh, quite an activist, a social activist. And I love this quote from her. In the long run, she says, we, we, the key here is we shape our lives and we shape ourselves. The process never ends until we die, and the choices we make are ultimately our own responsibility. The, and, and that's the key to it. The choices we make are ultimately our own responsibility, and we and and we take on the the, the responsibility of those. We assume the responsibility. We own our own behaviors. In Julius Caesar, William Shakespeare. Uh, quoted Julius Caesar saying to his to Brutus, the fault, dear Brutus, is not in the stars, because the the ancient Romans were very much about the the the, the pantheon of uh, gods and goddesses, uh, and and seeing things in the stars and stuff like that. But but Shakespeare, uh, in, with the voice of Julius Caesar, says the fault, Brutus, is not in our in the stars but in ourselves. In other words, I own the responsibility I have in these circumstances. Now, the, our piece of art for tonight is uh, another one from uh, that's taken from the biblical narrative. This is clearly not an uh, ancient piece of art. This is from the, the uh, 20th century. And uh, this is from a Russian artist who died back in 2016, Misha Brusilovsky. And I, I, I really like this, this painting. It is entitled Expulsion from Eden. Now, if you know anything about the biblical narrative, uh, of uh, the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and uh, God it, it gives to them the the, the uh, painting we had last week was the Sistine Chapel and Michelangelo and uh, it, the uh, the beautiful picture of God giving to Adam the the right of self determination, the, the response, but also the responsibility of self determination. And so, in this painting, what we have is the expression of of Adam and Eve's self-determination of their self-will, the free will that they had was in doing uh, a behavior which uh, God had commanded them not to do. And so it, it, as a consequence to that, he expels them from the Garden of Eden. And so this is the, this is the picture here that we have. It is a picture of accountability. It is a picture of owning actions, recognizing that the actions that I had were, uh, were not, uh, not good, were, were not in accordance with uh, the law or with ethical standards or with social standards, and therefore I have consequences. And I, I, I love the picture here uh, of, uh, uh, from the biblical narrative of Adam and Eve being expelled from the, from the Garden of Eden as an expression of the consequences for their for their actions. They were, in fact, held accountable. Um, so accountability is super important in the life, in, in the world of healthcare, and in, in the life of a, of a physician. And I hope you can see that, that it's, it's very much a part of what physicians uh, have to be all about. And in fact, uh, what I can say, and I'm going to refer to my notes here, is that, that um, healthcare providers have to be trustworthy, have to be reliable and dependable to who? Number one, first and foremost, to their patients, accountable to their patients. Putting the patient's interest before one's own interest is the first rule of professionalism. Lack of accountability is thought to be at the root of many, what? Malpractice lawsuits. The lack of accountability. Accountability is also linked to patient safety. For example, physicians who dependably practice good hygiene, hand hygiene between patients are less likely to spread infections. Uh, we're in the middle of that, obviously, right now with, with the COVID uh, pandemic. 
but it's accountable. This, these are real things in terms of patient care in the real world and that we hold ourselves accountable, that we hold each other accountable. There's so many stories of, uh, of, of uh, physicians. Uh, in fact, Dr. Ryan Gray and I were talking about this uh, earlier this week about a physician in Dallas uh, who only recently, within the last, I would say, five years or so, was finally brought to accountability and is fact and now in prison because he uh, because of malpractice because he was uh, he was practicing medicine uh, under the influence of drugs and alcohol uh, the, and this guy was a neurosurgeon and uh, he but the key to it it was so disappointing about the medical community is that nobody else held him accountable. Either. No other physicians, the hospitals that he worked at, he was not held accountable at all. And patients died because of it. So accountability is very important. Uh, yes, it's painful sometimes, but we all, we all recognize the importance, the importance of it. Uh, one of the things that I think is interesting about accountability is that we can hold each other accountable. We can hold ourselves accountable, and we can be held accountable by others outside of ourselves. This is one way uh, that mapped as a uh, as a, as uh, uh, as something you can sign up for uh, does for you is uh, that it, it can in fact sort of in, a, in an interesting sort of way hold you hold you accountable. It calculates those GPAs. It shows to you that the trend isn't good, and the feedback that we will be uh, ultimately giving you in, within the context of mapped is going to do just that. It's going to say, hey. This is not going to work. A 2.2 GPA is not going to get you into medical school. A 2.8 science GPA is not the best way to make yourself noticed in the application process. Uh, you can uh, hold yourself accountable through MAP by reflecting on your activities and on these uh, competencies, for example. Uh, through one-on-one -on -one advising uh, via MAP, uh, there is general uh, pre-med advising where there's this relationship uh, between, for example, me as an advisor and you as a student where I'm going to, uh, you know, hold you accountable. I was talking to a student today uh, who has uh, kind of uh, dropped off a little bit on, on studying for the MCAT. And so we were talking about that a little bit and about uh, uh, what's going on in his, in his particular world and, and how does that uh, how does that work out? And, and him holding himself accountable and me kind of uh, uh, piggybacking on that a, a bit and holding him accountable uh, also. So I'd encourage you to check out MAPT, uh, at the software itself, but also MAPT one-on-one uh, -on -one advising if you're interested. We do, we do essay feedback. We do interview prep, uh, uh, full cycle advising, and, and also just general advising if you want one session or more. But then also mapped as a product, you, you, you should uh, feel free to sign up for a free, uh, a free uh, uh, trial uh, for that. And, and uh, that's available to you. And, and, and look at that on map.com, M-A-P-P-D.com, and uh, check it out and tell your, tell your friends about it as well. So hopefully we'll have, uh, Rachel, we'll have some uh, questions tonight or comments. Uh, comments are always uh, welcome as well, um, which, uh, which would be great. And uh, uh, we'd look forward to that. So type, the, type your questions or, or your comments into the, into the comment uh, section, and, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly do those. Yeah, we got oh, a really good one a little yeah. bit ago that yeah. I'll put up that I think is a great place to start. So Christina asks, um, this is when you were talking about um, some, of, some of the competencies and, and attributes. Mm -hmm. um, and she asked, are these things that you want to mention in your personal statement or just make sure you make points about it during interviews? Well, I think some of them might be mentioned in a personal statement or in a, a secondary application essay or in, you know, another a spot where these might come onto the actual application would be in, in the descriptions of your activities, mm -hmm. uh, you know, where they, these could come out. But these are not going to uh, come out necessarily uh, in a straightforward way in the application. I mean, you're not going to say in the application, I am dependable. 
I am, you know, you might reflect on that and you might say what I learned from, for example, making a C in organic chemistry is that I had to uh, be more accountable with my time. Uh, and, and that, you know, I, what I learned from that was that I had to uh, force myself to to uh, to hold myself accountable, for example. Uh, they may come up in an interview. I mean, an interviewer is unlikely to say, oh, uh, let's talk about the pre-medical comp competencies and uh, which of them you have and which of them you don't have. Uh, but I think it's the gestalt, uh, which is a big psychology word, but... Yeah. It's it's the gestalt that we're talking about here. It's the sort of big picture of who you want to be as an individual, and not just uh, uh, not just concentrating on uh, or focusing in on uh, what do I have to do in the application process. But it's it's sort of this bigger picture of who do I want to be as an individual, who do I want to be as a pre med student, who do I want to be as an applicant. And ultimately, right. who do I want to be as a uh, as a physician? Yeah, I agree with that. I think that um, a lot of the people in admissions committees and the people who are doing interviews um, have seen many, many pre meds over the years, and they're skilled mm -hmm. at assessing those out, teasing those out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then the other thing I would say is, you know, especially for anyone here, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of Dr. Gray, or the co-founder of MAPT. Um, you know, Ryan's Gray has got thousands of podcast hours and videos available for free. He's got his um, pre-med playbooks. And one of the themes you hear over and over from, from Dr. Gray is um, show, don't tell. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of storytelling and that's not the only way to go about an application, but it's a way that he has found works really well, especially because so many pre-meds are used to doing things at bullet point list form. And right. again, I'm generalizing, but a lot of pre-meds have spent a lot of time building their science and math skills, potentially to the detriment of their writing skills. Right. It's not about <laughs> right. Right, not about talent, right? I'm talking about skills. And if you've been working really hard on science and math, maybe you haven't been working as hard on your writing. Um, right. So this idea of telling a story often gets those points across. So, you know, I mean, I think the original question asker made a great point that you do hope this comes through. But what we're suggesting is that if you emulate the behavior in your life, it will come through naturally in your application. So as opposed to sitting around and thinking like, how can I show people I'm accountable? Like, did you actually show up to volunteering on time every time? Yeah, it's kind yeah. of easy with volunteering to slack a little because yeah, yeah. it's volunteering. It's not a paid job. Right. But, you know, if, if the person who was your volunteer supervisor for four years can say the only time she was ever late, she got a flat tire. And by the time she was two minutes late, I knew something was horribly wrong yeah. because she's never late. Right. Then that's already telling us about your accountability. Right. You know, that's so right. that's that's the kind of thing that I think we're yeah. we're hoping that you're thinking about. Yeah. It's not not necessarily how this goes on your application, but how this how you can reflect on it in yourself and it will yeah. show up on the application. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Lots of good questions and comments yeah. coming here. I yeah. love the engagement guys. Okay. So Basha says, uh, could we discuss accountability when working in an environment or with people who look down upon making mistakes? I've had supervisors who expect perfection, which makes it challenging to admit errors. Ooh, mm -hmm. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the key there, and, and, and I, you know, not to not to uh, really, um, you know, say that the supervisor who expects perfection is 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 a good thing or whatever, but I think you know it's easy for us often to to say, well, I, I couldn't admit my error because my supervisor is such a such a uh, you know terrible person and he expects uh, he or she expects uh, perfection and so therefore I don't like to admit error because of whatever um, it, this happens a lot in in uh, in our world when we when we focus on uh, the legal aspects and, and this happens in medicine a lot when we focus on the legal aspects and when we let lawyers and I'll admit I have a bias sometimes against lawyers particularly some uh, who uh, you know focus on on, on certain types of, of law, and, and and so instead of me saying, "Yeah, I made a mistake," uh, and owning up to it, and, and saying this is going to cost my insurance company money or whatever, often we'll say, 
the, the, the legal eagles will say, you know, no, I don't want, you know, you, you shouldn't admit mistake. Uh, and we hear this a lot that without the admission of any responsibility, they came to a uh, agreement before the lawsuit, you know, went forward. And uh, this, this is the sort of world we live in. And this filters down to us as individuals in terms of our lack of, of willingness to, to take responsibility for, for what we've done. This is not to say that I, I think that um, the, the, the supervisor is right in terms of their expectations, um, but I think it's easy to chalk that up to the supervisor and say, well, because of that, I'm not going to take on ownership or I'm not going to admit responsibility. Uh, but instead of being like a stand-up person and saying, you know, I did it, Okay, so if I get in trouble, it doesn't change the fact that I made a mistake. Whether the supervisor uh, expects uh, perfection or not, it doesn't change the fact that I made a mistake. And I, I have to own up to that mistake. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think we've all been in work situations where we couldn't control the environment. And one thing you can take away from that is how you're going to be different when you have a chance to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I used to say to, I, I had a period of my life where I was managing a lot of people who were fresh out of college and often it was maybe not their first job, but their first full-time job. Um, and what I used to say is good employees make mistakes bad employees try to hide them. Yep. Um, and I'm so easy to manage up as a manager because if you come to me and say, okay, I did this wrong, but I think these are the three ways I can fix it. I'm just going to be like, go team. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Where if I find out from someone else about your mistake, it's a lot harder to get me on your side. Right. So as soon as people who work for me realize that they're like, oh, messed up, better go come clean to Rachel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like they, they get it. And um, there are other people like me out there who do that. So I definitely hear Scott, what you're saying, especially yeah. kind of in the legal medical world, there's sometimes right. this weirdness with like, you're not supposed to come forward, but there are a lot of other people who are like, well, let's be a team. Let's work together. Um, and, um, we do have some control over the way we interact with our peers mm -hmm. and the way we interact with ourself. Um, and you know, if it's scary to go to your boss, I would say definitely come to the boss with some solutions. Yeah. You know, don't just say I messed up. I messed up and here are my ideas yeah. for resolving it. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's, that's, that's part of being accountable is the fix. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Here's another interesting one. So the person says, I feel like there's a fine line to holding yourself accountable and taking on group guilt and blaming yourself for missteps, which may lead to second victim syndrome. How right. do we balance out these? Yeah, that's a good point. And I think, you know, what, what, I'm, what I'm not saying here is that we become self-bashers, that we bash ourselves and that we, you know, punish ourselves constantly for ac actions. And, and, and I think we all do that often. Uh, are some of us probably more than others in terms of our past behaviors. Uh, I know this is something that I've dealt with in my life where, you know, and it's, it's when I, I don't know if anybody else can relate to this, but you know, there are times when I'm just, you know, pops into my head, some stupid thing I did when middle school and, and then I beat myself up over it and I, I'm holding myself accountable for something that happened 45 years ago. I'm like, oh uh, my gosh. <laughs> this is how messed up I am sometimes. It's not just you. It <laughs> Rachel, not you can relate you. to that, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, yeah. Uh, no, that's so common that I think there's like comic essays about it, about like your brain's top hits. You know? oh, yes. oh, yes. <laughs> like, do you remember the time you, <laughs> <laughs> yep. But I, you know, and, and this is not to make light of the question. I, I definitely feel like, you know, what, what we're not talking about here is, is bashing uh, yourself. It is the ownership of responsibility, facing the consequences that come from it and then moving on and uh, not dwelling on, on the past, but moving on into the future uh, and, but but learning from key here in terms of acceptance of responsibility and accountability is learning from the process. Uh, yeah. That's really important. Yeah. And someone earlier had said, 
um, that maybe a lot of accountability ties back to oral communication. And I agree mm -hmm. because I think mm -hmm. with, um, uh, I'm sorry, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, with Calvin, I think's question, um, you know, he's, it sounds like he's thinking about a time that there was a group mistake. Well, so that means that having a tough conversation with the other members of those group. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Hey guys, here's the part that I think I could have done better, but I think we could have done better. Right. You know, what right. do you think? And, yeah. um, you know, some of that is learning how to present a problem in a way that doesn't make people feel defensive, you know, and mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. there are lots of different tips for that. I mean, there's books you can read, there's YouTube videos. Uh, as you guys, I think I've already heard Scott and I say, big fan of therapy for those skills, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. sometimes it's about admitting your own nerves first. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey guys, this is, I'm a little nervous to bring this up. I hope, I hope that you'll understand I'm trying to be helpful. He, I think we goofed. Here's the thing I think I could have done better. What do you guys think yeah. you could have done better? When you approach yeah. it that way, yeah. then hopefully you'll have peers who yeah. are receptive to that discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then to your point, you're taking your own accountability, but you're also mm -hmm. trying to help your peers. Right. Um, and, and you're not and it might be asking them, what else do you think I could have done better? Right. Yeah. Like and you're open. And you're not playing the blame game, you know, it's not, it's not a, well, who did this or what, you know, you did that and you did that, you know, it's, it's, what is the solution here and what do we learn from this, mm -hmm. this, uh, the, the, the circumstance that we find ourselves in? Absolutely. Yep. All right. So RL asks, how do you hold yourself accountable or express accountability for a low GPA due to illness or having to transfer school a few times? And then there was sort of a follow up, which is especially in a personal statement. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's always an issue of uh, of, of learning of, of uh, what what has this done for you. Uh, part of accountability is this taking on not only of responsibility for for whatever happened, and sometimes things occur, and, and, and you had no role in it as 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 responsibility. But but um, what I'm saying here is that we, we learn and we grow from these experiences. And that's what needs to come out in the personal statement it is the growth that has happened from these experiences. Now, what you express in the question is about a low GPA, but what, what the, what the admissions committee doesn't want to hear is my GPA is so low because X, Y, and Z. What they want to hear is what have I done to make this a better situation? Uh, because what 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 an admissions committee is gonna is gonna say is what if you get sick in medical school? Yep. Are you are you gonna are you gonna fail, fail? Are you gonna you know flunk out? Are you know are you gonna crash and burn? Uh, you know what? Where has the learning happened? And what have you learned? What 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 meaning have you taken away from the circumstances that occurred? And uh, how has that made you a better person now? than you were previously. That's, mm -hmm. that's, I think, really important. 100%. Another good one. Micah asks, how potentially harmful can it be if the desirable traits that you try to project in medical schools to medical schools aren't reflected and validated in the letter of recommendation that you receive? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, this is something that you're not necessarily ever going to know because 90, 95, 99% of the time, You've waived access to those letters of recommendation, so you don't know what they're saying. Now, from the perspective of, of an admissions committee member, uh, it can be pretty pretty devastating sometimes. I, you know, it's very rare, and I will say this: uh, it's very rare to get negative um, letters of recommendation. Uh, it, I would say it happens, you know, I, I, in the in the, the 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 years of my experience in medical education. In terms of a of a negative letter of recommendation, I would say it's it's very rare. Um, and and in fact, when I was uh, uh, you know undergrad advisor and running the pre med programs, uh, when we would write letters letters of evaluation on students, if if we had a lot of negative things to say, then we would often go to the student and say, "You might want to rethink whether you want us to write this letter or not." Uh, and, and, and to explain to them why that was the case. And, uh, and, and, and so what I would say is um, it's pretty rare. Now, what I think is more, uh, more often happens is that the letter just doesn't say much at all. 
And uh, instead of saying something negative, it doesn't say a whole lot at all about you. Uh, she was in my class, uh, seemed to uh, get the material pretty well, made an A in the class. I don't really have any contact with her outside of, uh, outside of class that much. And, and that's about all they say. Uh, that's not a very helpful letter, but it's not a negative letter, but it doesn't help in the process at all. So mm -hmm. I would say more to the point of the question is that I, I think it's difficult, but it's not very normal to see letters that are going to point out less than desirable traits. Uh, I would say it's very rare. And uh, the occasions when it does happen, uh, it, it, it was really an in, in instance of the letter writer being so concerned that this person should not be in medicine that they made the point of saying, I don't think this person should be in medicine, which is, you know, that's super rare, but I mean, it has occurred. I've, I've seen letters like that, or mm -hmm. I've had gotten phone calls from advisors who say, uh, I, I wouldn't write this person a letter, but you need to know this. <laughs> and it's like, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, and that goes back to, we've talked about being self-aware. Um, uh, that's right. And, you know, one thing I recommend when you ask for letters of recommendation is ask if they would be willing to write a strong, strong recommendation yep. for you. Yep. And I know it's really hard these days with pandemic life. What I used to always tell people is don't email, don't call, go in person. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, part of why you're going in person is you're not looking for the yes or no. You're looking for the pause. Yes. Because if there's a pause, you may want to give them a tactful out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, because some people are going to say, I mean, I, I've done it before. I've said, I mean, I had someone once that I fired and then wanted a letter of recommendation. Yeah. I was like, you know, I'm going to be honest, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, do you, do you want to take back that ask? I mean, that was pretty crazy. <laughs> um, I mean, it's just like that person right. was not self-aware. <laughs> um, but um, but sometimes they're not going to be that that direct with you. So you're kind yeah. of looking for that read between the lines. And that's still possible in pandemic life, because it might mean you email the professor and say, I would love to have a 10 or 15 minute video call with you to catch catch up. And mm -hmm. then on the video call, ask the question and mm -hmm. you can read the mm -hmm. eye contact. And it's because, um, yeah, what you're hoping is if you say strong recommendation that they would say, well, I can write one, but I don't know if I know you well enough to write a strong one. And, you know, then it goes to, um, Scott, you like to talk about ideal versus acceptable. Right, right. right. To me, that's not ideal, and you should go looking. If you're having a lot of trouble finding anyone to say, I'd write you a strong one, that might be a whole other problem, which, again, doesn't mean you're not qualified. Maybe it means you haven't done a good job of making yourself known to these people. Right, that's right. Um, but that's right. you'd want to find out, right? Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. That's exactly, that's exactly right. So here's a really interesting one. I guess it's a little bit about accountability of another group. Um, so do med schools manipulate the numbers on the med MSR? Um, so the medical school admissions requirements. I'm not exactly sure what the, what you mean by manipulate the numbers. I'm guessing that you're suggesting that if they say that they're, average GPA of their incoming class is 3.7. Are you asking, is that, are they manipulating that number? And the answer is no. I mean, I've, I've really never seen that at all. And, and it would be completely unethical if, if they do, but I, I that, that doesn't translate or, or compute for me at all. So I would say no. Yeah, I guess what I would maybe add to that, I mean, I also think the answer is no, um, is keep in mind that many people misread the MSAR because they see that mean or median and start to internalize it as a cutoff, you know, right, so, right. oh, you know, the average is 3.7 and I have a 3.55, so now I'm not a competitive applicant. Right, right. Um, and. Now, there are different schools of thoughts on this. So Dr. Gray is a big believer in not actually spending that much time looking at the numbers in the MSAR. I feel like, again, as I might be generalizing, but as a group, I would say pre-meds really like numbers. You're mm -hmm. going to want to look at the numbers. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. what I ask you to do is dig a little deeper. Yeah. Don't just look at that, me that median 
um, or it's the mean. I don't know why I'm forgetting which one it is today, but click on the file, right? Don't just yeah. look at the quick view that you get. Actually yeah. open the med school file, yeah. scroll down about, I don't know, eight inches. And somewhere in there is the 10th and 90th percentiles of GPA yeah. Yeah. and MCAT. And yeah. that's going to give you a much better, much better sense of who actually is in that class from the last yeah. year. Yeah. And, you know, I'm not saying you should apply to every single school if you're at the 10th percentile, but if you are at the 10th percentile and it's a school that you've got your heart set on for some other reason, I think you should still apply. Yeah, um, sure. Sure. Yeah. And the, the only guarantee is, as I've said before, is if you do not apply, you will not get in. So. That's exactly right. Well, I think we have another one in the books, Rachel. Is is are we out of time yeah. for the night? Yeah, we're coming to the end. Yeah. I don't know if we got to every single one, but we'll be back next week. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so next week is growth orientation. Growth that orientation. Right? That's right. And then and then we'll have a a wrap up week uh, the following week, and then then it's Thanksgiving, and we're all eating turkey. Yeah home alone with masks um, yeah, yeah right exactly <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah so thank you again everyone for attending we look forward to seeing you again next week and the week after so yeah absolutely um, absolutely we appreciate how engaged you are i love all these thoughtful questions yeah absolutely and thank you all all for uh being here tonight and as always we, we're appreciative for you and, and what you do and what your goals are and we, we're cheering you on from the sidelines for sure definitely Take care, everybody. All right.